Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, God's Teacher, from raystedman.org. The text for this message is from 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16. Second chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 10 this morning. I think one of the things that deeply impressed everyone who ever heard Jesus himself teach was the fact that he spoke uh, with such authority about things that other people knew nothing about. Remember how in the Gospels uh, he seems to read the thoughts of other people's minds. He answers questions before they're even asked. He accurately identifies the motives that move people to speak or to act. And even more than this, he speaks of unseen things with familiarity, as though he had seen them himself. He describes the nature of angels, what God is like. He uh, describes what happens after death. He predicts future events with pinpoint accuracy. And he seems to know a body of truth that um, other people do, do not have any access to. And you remember at the close of his ministry in the upper room discourse as he was about to leave his disciples and they were filled with foreboding and, and uh, despair, not only because of the loss of his presence, but because of the loss of his wisdom and his power, that he said to them, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you alone, he said. I will... If I go away, I will send another comforter to you, and he will guide you into all the truth. He will take of the things of mine, he says, and show them unto you, and he will say to you the things that I have not been able to say. Remember, he said, I've yet many things to say to you, but you aren't able to bear them yet. But when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now in this section in, second, in 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul is clearly referring to that promise of our Lord about the coming of the spirit and what the spirit would teach us when he came. In this chapter, remember, he told how he came into the city of Corinth and found a city that was committed to the philosophy and wisdom of men. And even after the church had begun there, the Christians were still uh, exalting the wisdom of men and speaking of, of the philosophers and following after various men as they spoke. And the apostle has shown how the cross of Christ undercuts all the pride of man and all the boasting of man in his power and glory. And instead, he speaks of what he calls a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which is made available to us by the Spirit. And uh, you recall, just by way of review, he has said four things about that, that secret and hidden wisdom. It says, first of all, it's intended for our glorification. That is, God designed it to complete human beings, to bring them to fulfillment. It's the missing links in, our, in, in the body of truth about ourselves and about our humanity. This, uh, this body of truth is not uh, something just religious. It's something that men everywhere desperately need in order to fulfill their humanity. And therefore, it's designed, Paul says, and intended for our glorification. That is to make us into men and women who are the kind of human beings that God designed human beings to be. To produce beautiful people, not only outwardly, but inwardly as well. Loving, compassionate, strong, uh, and yet merciful and tender-hearted people who are filled with both grace and beauty and strength. Now that's a glorified humanity. And that's what this body of truth will do. I just spent yesterday at the airport in, in Atlanta 
for about two hours listening to a pastor who had been out to one of our pastor's seminars tell me how he had gone home and begun to teach the truth that he had learned here to the men of his church. Eighteen of them had volunteered to meet with him for a series of studies, and he had to divide them up into three different groups. And he imparted to them truth about the new covenant, truth about the body of Christ, truth about spiritual gifts. And he said as they began to catch on to these things, they became visibly different men. He told me how wives, the wives of several of them came to him and said, What are you doing to my husband? I can't believe it. He's just a different man. Our home is being transformed. Everything's different. Now that's the body of truth that Paul is speaking of in this chapter, that secret and hidden wisdom of God, which was ordained before the ages unto our glorification. Second thing he says about it is, it's a permanent body of truth. You learn these things, and you're not only going to be prepared to live in time, but also in eternity. It's something that does not pass away and fade with the changing of the years. I was reading recently one of Dr. A.C. Custance's books, and he recalled in there an incident that took place when he was a pre-medical student in college. And the teacher was teaching them on evolution. And he had, uh, was working with a blackboard and showing them lo- the line of ascent uh, of how human life developed, beginning first with the amoeba, and then the reptiles, and then the amphibians, and finally the, the mammals, and so on, all through up to the human line. And this line of ascent was punctuated at various intervals by the appearance of various categories of life. And when he had reached man, he said, Of course you know, uh, gentlemen, that one day the universe will end in a, in, a, in a heat death. And this line, he said, will peter out into nothing. And Dr. Custon said there was a notice, of, there was a long silence and a kind of uneasy shifting in the seat. And finally, one of the young students said, Sir, Is that all there is? And the professor said, Yes, that's all I know that there is. And it was obvious that the class was uneasy about the meaninglessness of existence. But here's a body of truth, Paul says, that is designed to transcend time. It's intended not to pass away, but to prepare us, not only for now, but for later, for the great life that lies awaiting us beyond. Then the third thing he says is, this body of truth is undiscoverable by natural processes. You can't learn about it in the university. You cannot take a course in it in any secular school. No philosopher Uh, speaking outside the Christian uh, framework, ever unfolds this line of truth. No psychologist or psychiatrist who isn't instructed in the scriptures knows anything about this line of truth. I cannot find it, Paul says. That is the observation, the power of observation. Ear cannot discover it. That is, listening to the voices of the past. You won't read about it in history. Nor is it even available to the reason, to the mind of man. You cannot reason this out. And yet it's truth without which men and women falter and fail and homes break up and violence breaks out in human society and all the evils that we see around us begin to flood in. Therefore, it's the most vital line of truth the world can know anything about. What the apostle says is, it's made known to us by the Spirit. So it's revealed to us, he says, by the Spirit. It is available. We don't have to suffer without it. But it's only made known 
by the Spirit. Verse 10, God has revealed to us these things through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what person knows a man's thoughts except the spirit of the man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. That introduces to us now this mighty teacher come from God, the Holy Spirit himself, who is designed to instruct us with the word of God and lead us into the truth of God that will change our life and expose us to this secret and hidden wisdom of God. When you discover that, I want to tell you something. Life's going to be exciting and adventurous like nothing you ever dreamed before. For this line of truth is designed to release us, set us free, and let us be the men and women God designed us to be. Notice how the apostle underscores here the Spirit's knowledge first. No one, he says, understands the things of a man except the spirit of man that is in him. Did you ever try to talk to your plants? I know a lot of people that do that these days. We're being encouraged to talk to our plants. We're told that they can respond to our moods and they reflect our attitudes and And there are people that do that. They talk to their plants. I know a woman who even prays over each plant. I don't know what it does for the plant, but it probably helps her a great deal. (laughs) But uh, it's clearly evident that the plants do not talk back. If they do, give me a call right away. I'll see (laughs) if I can help you. You see, life is constructed at various levels, but uh, the higher can take hold of the lower, but the lower cannot reach up to the higher. We have plant life, we have animal life, and then human life, then angelic life, and finally divine life. And the the highest can reach down to encompass the lower, but the lower cannot reach up to the higher. That's his argument here. And though no animal can reach into the realm of human relationship and, and, and converse with us, other people can. Other human beings like ourselves can do so. Do you ever try to tell your troubles to your dog? I know people that do. I've watched it. I've done it myself. <laughs> A dog is a very friendly animal, man's best friend, and he seems so sympathetic, and it looks like it would be such a delightful thing to talk to your dog. And you know what he does? He'll whine and wag his tail and lick you on the face, and he's trying so hard to understand, but he cannot comprehend the things of a man. He knows you're trying to get something across but he doesn't know what it is. But if you sit down and tell your troubles to your wife, she'll understand, most of them. (laughs) Or your husband, or your friend. And fortunate is the man whose wife is his friend, or the woman whose husband is her friend. They can understand because the spirit which is in man shares a common basis of knowledge. Now here's this great being of God in our universe. This fantastic being of infinite wisdom, mighty power. And how can we know anything about him? Paul's answer is we can't except he discloses himself to us. You cannot by searching find out God. Man by wisdom does not know God. Man by investigation of all the natural forces of life will never find his way to the heart of God. Only God himself must disclose himself, must open himself to us. And that he's done by means of the Spirit of God. The Spirit has come. Uh, to teach us about God. 
the Lord Jesus himself appeared as a man in order that we might have a visible demonstration of what God is like. And the simplest answer to the question of what is God like is to say he's like Jesus under all circumstances. But it's the work of the Spirit to show us what Jesus is like. Jesus said, he will take of the things of mine and show them unto you. And you can read about the record of the Gospels and read the historical record of Jesus, but the living Lord doesn't stand out from the pages just by reading it. It's as the Spirit illuminates those pages and makes that vivid and real that you find yourself confronted with the living, breathing Christ himself. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul describes the method that the Spirit has taken by which he does this fantastic thing. And he begins with, the, with this in verse 12. Now we have, he says, received, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might be understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the Spirit. That seems a rather complicated passage, and perhaps it is. I think we can get help from it if we look at it rather simply. There are five steps here that Paul says the Spirit of God has followed in order to teach us this secret and hidden wisdom of God. The first step is he begins with the apostles. We, Paul says, we apostles, he means, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God. The spirit of the world is that philosophy, that intelligent, strange being behind the whole thinking of the world. He's described to us in very clear and vivid terms in Ephesians, the second chapter, where Paul says, You, you believers, he made alive when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And from that we learn that behind all the strange, mixed up, confused knowledge and wisdom of the world is this strange spiritual being the Bible calls the devil. The world doesn't know that. They're... They're like so many dumb uh, animals led to slaughter without even realizing where they're going. And Paul says that's not the spirit we've received. Remember how he puts it to Timothy. We have not received the spirit of fear to fall back into bondage, but we have received the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. Now, Jesus had said this would happen. He said to the disciples, He, the Spirit, is now with you. He shall be in you. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came in a new and fresh way. He'd been there present before in the world. But he entered into the believers, the disciples. And from then on, these apostles who were to give us the Scriptures were filled, were men and women filled with the Spirit. And then Paul tells us the second step was the Spirit of God taught them, illuminated their minds. We have received the Spirit which is from God that we might understand the things, not the gifts, but the things given to us by God. He's not talking about spiritual gifts here. He's talking about the whole realm of knowledge and truth that God has given to us. Now, these apostles began to understand it. Have you ever noticed in reading the Gospels that the apostles didn't understand Jesus when he taught? He baffled them. He puzzled them. He said things that left them scratching their head. 
He angered them at times. He upset them. He said things sometimes to people that embarrassed them. On one occasion, it says they turned to him and said, Lord, don't you realize you offended those Pharisees? As if he didn't realize that. And he was constantly puzzling them. They couldn't understand what he was saying. But when the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, suddenly all that Jesus had said began to make a wonderful sense. And thinking back over all that they had heard from his lips, they began to see it in a totally different light. That's the reason why non-Christians can read their Bibles and it seems to be a totally different book to them than when a Christian reads it. You've, uh, many of you perhaps have had that experience. Before you became Christians, you read the Bible and it was such a dull book. There was nothing in it exciting. It just seemed to be such a, uh, a graceless, dull and, and uh, tedious book. Then you became a Christian. You received the Spirit. And the result was the book just came alive. Things uh, uh, that you uh, once had puzzled over became clear. And you found yourself fascinated by it. man said to me just the other day that he, he'd just become a Christian and he'd gone home and for four and a half hours straight he couldn't lay the Bible down because the Spirit was teaching him from its pages. Now, this is what Paul is talking about here. This began with the apostles. They were illuminated by the Spirit. And then another phenomenon happened. Verse 13, And we impart this, he said, in words not taught by human wisdom, but words, is implied here, words taught by the Spirit. As you know, one of the major arguments of this of our day is over the question of the inerrancy of Scripture. People are asking afresh today, is everything in the Bible true? Does the Bible speak with authority in every realm of life? Is it true what it says about scientific matters and geographic matters, and astronomical matters, and so on? Or is it only true when it tells you how to go to heaven? I think that question is answered by this statement of Paul. He says that when the apostles began to speak and to write the scriptures, they did so by words taught by the Holy Spirit. And I don't think he meant by that that the Spirit of God dictated the Bible to them. Oftentimes evangelicals are accused of believing in a dictation theory. That is not what Paul describes here. What he's really talking about is a, a process by which the Spirit of God awakened the minds of the apostles to understand truth, and they chose their own words to express it so that every apostle's personality comes through in the writing that he uses. And yet, in a strange and wonderful way, those words which the apostle chose are words that God himself approves. And therefore, they come from him. Not in a direct sense, but in an, in an indirect sense. And if that is true, that every word of Scripture, as Paul says to Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out from God. If that is true, then it comes from a God who cannot lie a God who makes no mistakes, a God who sees the end from the beginning, and every word of Scripture is true. And therefore, as the apostles write these things down, we can trust what they have to say. So a young man was just telling me just before this service how he's discovered in his life that he doesn't have to understand the Bible always in order to benefit from its wisdom. He says, I've learned that I don't always understand everything it tells me, but I know this. If I obey it, I will benefit from what it says. And that's the truth. 
because it's the word of God, the living word, the word of truth from the spirit of truth. Now that's the third step in this process. Then there's a fourth one. Paul says, we are impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who possess the spirit. That whole phrase is just a translation of three words in Greek. And it's a difficult phrase to translate. You'll notice if you have a RSV in the margin, there are three, two other possible translations given. One is interpreting spiritual truths in spiritual language, and the other is comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And it's obvious from that it's rather difficult to translate it. The verb that is translated here, interpreting, is really a word that means to fit things together. And what I think the apostle is describing here is the process of taking the wisdom of God, these great facts about our, uh, about our personality, our makeup, and facts about life, and facts about God himself that are revealed in this secret and hidden wisdom of God, and fitting them to the circumstances and the personalities of each individual. In other words, making the word living to us. That's the work of the Spirit of God as well. We've all had that experience if you're a believer. Now this, in order to do this, we must be indwelt by the Spirit as well. And Paul uses a word here that indicates that. He calls us spiritual people. Pneumatikoi is the word, and it comes from the word for the Greek word for spirit, which is pneuma. Well, who are the pneuma, the pneumatikoi, the spiritual people? Well, those who have received the spirit. You know that one of the arguments widespread today is how do you receive the spirit? There are some that tell us it must be by a dramatic demonstration that uh, results in speaking in tongues. I, I was talking with a girl not long ago, and, and she said, you know, the evidence for receiving the Spirit is speaking in tongues. And I said, do you mean to say that everybody who has not spoken in tongues does not have the Spirit? And she said, well, um, no, I didn't mean to say that. Well, I said, you said that the evidence for the receiving the Spirit is speaking in tongues. Well, she said, maybe there's something else there that I don't understand. And I assured her that there was. <laughs> uh, according to the scriptures, you receive the Spirit when you believe in Jesus. That's what he himself said. On the great day of the feast recorded in John 7, he said, he stood and said, come unto me and drink. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And John adds this, he spoke about the Spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. And in the first chapter of John's Gospel, he says, as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power. Now power is the work of the Spirit. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. So that everywhere in the scripture you find that it's only at the moment when you believe the word about Jesus, who he is, what he did, and what he can do for you as Lord of your life, in that moment you receive the Spirit. And there's a beautiful analogy that scripture draws. Have you... Uh, Notice that how oftentimes the scripture compares the new birth to the to physical human birth. This is Mother's Day. And all you mothers who are here have been made mothers because you gave birth. And every one of you will know that though the moment of birth was an unforgettable time, the moment of conception occurred without you even realizing it. 
when uh, in a, in a uh, an experience of love, two tiny seeds joined together, you didn't even know it happened. But a new life began by that union, and it began to develop and grow, and soon it became evident to you and to everyone else that a new life was there. Now that's the way the Holy Spirit is born into our hearts. No one knows when it happens. But when the seed of our faith, the ovum of faith, meets the sperm of the truth of God about Jesus, a new birth occurs. The Holy Spirit enters a life. And those who receive the Spirit then are, are born again into a new, crea- a new creation, Paul terms it, and as such are rendered spiritual persons. Now the Apostle goes on to contrast this in the next passage, which we'll not look at this morning, with carnal Christians. And what he means is that carnality is a way of, for the moment, temporarily not relating to the Spirit. But spiritual-minded Christians are those who not only have received the Spirit, but as Paul describes it in Romans 8, they have set their minds on the things of the Spirit. They listen to the Spirit. They hear the word of the Spirit. They believe the word. They act upon the word of the Spirit. And then this whole body of truth becomes uh, active in their life, and their life is changed. Now there's the process. Begins with the indwelling of the apostles, then the illuminating of the apostles' minds, the preaching of the apostles in words chosen by the Spirit, the indwelling of every believer by the belief of the word that the apostles preached, and the illuminating uh, of of the minds of each believer to understand truth as it fits him or her life directly. That's the process by which this great body of fascinating truth, the secret and hidden wisdom of God, which is intended for our glorification, will begin to change our lives, our homes, our families, our community, our nation, and ultimately the whole of the world. You'd never think up that process, would you? No man ever designed that, but God did. And the evident results of it are so fantastic, so powerful in their effect, as Paul will go on to describe them in verses 14 to 16, that I want to leave them for a separate treatment. That that passage describes to us why the world can never solve its problems, why it is locked into the same pattern of failure generation after generation, And the only breakthrough that can ever occur is to someone who opens their mind and heart to the word of the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, and begins to live on the basis of these life-transforming things. Well, we're going to leave it there. Let's stand together now and be dismissed. Father, how grateful we are for this mighty teacher come from you the Spirit of God, come into our hearts to instruct us of the things of Jesus and give unto us his very life, that we might live in a different way, in a new way. Lord, we thank you that you've made available to us, to the simplicity of faith, profound and mighty truths that men in their wisdom and arrogance cannot discover but which is open to the simple and the humble-hearted among us. We pray with Jesus and thank you, Father, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes. Help us then to be babes in understanding that we might uh, accept these truths and find them delivering us from the power and the grip of evil. We pray in Jesus' name.
upon my praise as I sing of your love. Holy Spirit, fire, burn within my soul as I call on your name. As I call on your name.
all things new Great God of creation Oh and Father You will always be my rock and salvation Oh, oh.